Hi everybody, David from Binacker01. Today we're going to continue further with The Smoky God, an audiobook with a little bit of commentary here and there. Um, before we jump into to part two, which is actually the start of it, the, the part one, which you can see online, is actually the author's foreword. Mr. Emerson here, Willis George Emerson. The book is from 1908, just to remind you. Go back down here again. And now we're going to get into the part about Olaf Yonsa, the, the real meat of the story, because he's the one who supposedly told the story to Mr. Emerson. My name is Olaf Janssen. I'm a Norwegian, although I was born in the little seafaring Russian town of Uleborg on the eastern coast of the Gulf of Bothnia in the northern arm of the Baltic Sea. And just to check it out here, that location location is right here in modern day Finland. So I was wondering if it has a slightly different name, is it the right place? But apparently it is, it was, uh, you know, war and uh, terrible things happened in the 1800s. And uh, there was a small town, as it reads here, there was a small town in the Gulf of Bothnia called Ullenberg, which was purely a commercial place. And when visited in the course of the present month, where there were Majesty's vessels was found to be perfectly defenseless. So it was just probably just a fishing village. And um, so that apparently is where he was born. But as we read, my parents were on a fishing cruise in the Gulf of Bothnia and put into the Russian town of Ullenburg at the time of my birth, being the 27th day of October, 1811. So he was, yeah, obviously uh, not, not Russian, Finnish, but it's amazing that was Russian back then. I didn't realize that. My father, Jens Janssen, almost reminds me of Jan Janssen. It's like a popular bike uh, in the Netherlands. My father, Jens Janssen, was born at Rodvig on the Scandinavian coast near the Lofton Islands, but after marrying, made his home at Stockholm because my mother's people resided in that city. When seven years old, I began going with my father on his fishing trips along the Scandinavian coast. And uh, we can see here the Ludwig Islands, which he, where his father um, came from, was way up here in northern. And of course, Stockholm is down here. Lofoten, this is the modern day spelling. Dramatic scenery, large peaks, must be beautiful up there. It'd be, it must be amazing to go check it out. Just look at some of these little pictures here, you know. Anyway, early in my life, I displayed an aptitude for books and at the age of nine years was placed at a, in a private school in Stockholm, remaining there until I was 14. After this, I made regular trips with my father on all his fishing voyages. My father was a man of fully six feet three in height and weighed over 15 stone, about 200 and something pounds, 205 pounds, 210 pounds, a typical Norseman of the most rugged sort and capable of more endurance than any other man I have ever known. He possessed the gentleness of a woman and tender little things that his determination and willpower were beyond description. His will admitted of no defeat. I was in my 19th year when we started on what proved to be our last trip as fishermen and which resulted in the strange story that shall be given to the world, but not until I finish my earthly pilgrimage. I dare not allow the facts as I know them to be published while I am living. The fear of further humiliation, confinement, and suffering. First of all, I was put in irons by the captain of the whaling vessel that rescued me. For no other reason than I told the truth about the marvelous discoveries made by my father and myself. But this was far from being the end of my tortures. After four years and eight months absence, I reached Stockholm, only to find my mother had died the previous year and the property left by my parents in the possession of my mother's people. But it was at once made over to me. All might have been well had I erased from my memory the story of our adventure and my father's terrible death. Finally, one day, I told the story in detail to my uncle, Gustav Usterlind a man of considerable property and urging to fit out 
an expedition for me to make another voyage to the strange land. At first, I thought he favored my project. He seemed interested and invited me to go before certain officials and explain to them, as I had to him, the story of our travels and discoveries. I imagine my disappointment and horror when, upon the conclusion of my narrative, certain papers were signed by my uncle, and without warning, I found myself arrested and hurried away to dismal, to dismal and fearful confinement in a madhouse, where I remained for 28 years, long, tedious, frightful years of suffering. I can only imagine. I, I just want to show here, if you go to the um, sacredtext.com version, you get some pictures, and this is uh, one picture pulled off uh, in confinement. 28 years, long, tedious, frightful years of suffering. I mean, Gustav Oosterlund, I thought it might be a slightly more unique name than uh, Jens Janssen and uh, Olaf Janssen, but uh, there, unfortunately there seems to be a lot of uh, Gustav Oosterlunds around. Good for them. And what's interesting, you could actually do some uh, ancestry, you know, background checks and try to dig out, find out who, who these, you know, they really exist and what have you. I never ceased to assert my sanity and to protest against the injustice of my confinement. Finally, on the 17th day of October, 1862, I was released. My uncle was dead and the friends of my youth were now strangers. Indeed, a man over 50 years old, whose only known record is that of a madman. He has no friends. I was at a loss to know what to do for a living, but instinctively turned toward the harbor, where fishing boats were in great numbers were anchored. And within a week, I had shipped with a fisherman by the name of Jan Hansen, <laughs> who was starting on a long fishing cruise to the Lofton Islands. That's where his father was, uh, was from, right up there. Here, my early years of training proved to be very, to be of the very greatest advantage, especially in enabling me to make myself useful. This was but the beginning of other trips, and by frugal economy, I was, in a few years, able to own a fishing brig of my own. For 27 years thereafter, I followed the sea as a fisherman, five years working for others, and the last 22 for myself. During all these years, I was a most diligent student of books, as well as a hard worker at my business. But I took great care not to mention to anyone the story concerning discoveries made by my father and myself. Yeah, I could imagine. Even at this late day, I would be fearful of having anyone see or know the things I am writing. And the records and maps I have in my keeping, when my days on earth are finished, I shall leave the maps and records that will enlighten and I hope benefit mankind. The memory of my long confinement with maniacs and all the horrible anguish and sufferings are too vivid to warrant me taking further chances. In 1889, I sold out my fishing boats and found I had accumulated a fortune quite significant to keep me the remainder of my life. I then came to America. For a dozen years, my home was in Illinois near Batavia, where I gathered most of the books in my present library though I thought many choice volumes from Stockholm. Though I brought many choice volumes from Stockholm. Later, I came to Los Angeles, arriving here March 4th, 1901, the date I remember as it was President McKinley's second inauguration day. I bought this humble home and determined here in the privacy of my own adobe, sheltered by my own vin, vine and fig tree. Interesting fig tree. And with my books about me to make maps and drawings of the new lands we had discovered and also to write the story in detail from the time my father and i left stockholm until the tragic event that parted us in the antarctic ocean i will remember that we left stockholm in our fishing slope sloop on the third day of april 1829 and sailed to the southward leaving Gulthard island to the left and Oland island to the right so they came out here, cruise down, you know, through here probably. And they got to go up through here, I guess. Up through here. A few days later, we succeeded in doubling 
some more point and made our way through the sound which separates Denmark from the Scandinavian coast. In due time, we put in at the town of Christiansen Sand, where we rested two days and then started around the Scandinavian coast to the westward bound of the Lofton Islands. So just so you see, this is a uh, Christiansen Lund, you know, nestled up in here. So they cruised up, came up over here. And those other Lofton Islands are up here somewhere, up here. My father was in high spirit because of the excellent and gratifying returns he had received from our last catch by marketing at Stockholm instead of selling at one of the seafaring towns along the Scandinavian coast. He was especially pleased with the sale of some ivory tusks that he found on the west coast of Franz Josef land during one of his northern cruises the previous year. And he expressed the hope that this time we might again be fortunate enough to load our little fishing sloop with ivory instead of cod, herring, mackerel and salmon. And so this is where he ended up with those tusks to follow the last time. And that's way up there. I mean, that's that little archipelago there. And then it's way up here. I mean, it's, it's up there by the, by the poles. We put in Hamra faced latitude to 71 degrees and 40 minutes for a few days rest. Here we remained one week laying an extra supply of provisions and several casks of drinking water and then sailed towards Spitsbergen. Pittsburgh and just so you see here is Hammerfest Hammerfest even still a pretty small place and that's way up by the tip and they're going to be uh, heading uh, up this way up these ways for the first few days we had an open sea and favoring wind and then we encountered much ice and many icebergs a vessel larger than our little fishing sloop could not possibly have treaded its way among the labyrinth of icebergs or squeezed through the barely open channels. These monster bergs present an endless succession of crystal palaces, massive cathedrals, and fantastic mountain ranges, grim and centil like, immovable as some towering cliff of solid rock standing, silent as a sphinx, resisting the relentless waves. Fishful sea. On that note, we can get a look at it uh, right here. A vessel larger than our little fishing sloop could not have tread its way among the icebergs. After many narrow escapes, we arrived at Spitsbergen on the 23rd of June and anchored at Ouija Bay for a short time, where we were quite successful in our catches. We then lifted anchor and sailed through the Hinlopen Strait and coasted along the northeast land. Uh, there's a notation here. It will be remembered the, that Andre started on his fatal balloon voyage to the northwest coast of Spitsbergen. Just wanted to interject here. This, uh, you know, in the book there, he talks about, like, yeah, everyone knows who Andre is. Of course, back then, it sounds like they would have. Uh, it, was, it was a fatal balloon crash. But one thing that's interesting, you can read all about it on Wikipedia. Oh, yeah. The, the scheme was received with patriotic enthusiasm in Sweden, a northern nation that had fallen behind in the race for the North Pole. So I think that's important to remember about the whole time period this all was taking place, late 1800s, the, uh, the book and this exposition. There was a race to the North Pole. It was the great unknown, you know, still to a large degree is. But of course, it's a lot different today. A strong wind came from the southwest and my father said that we had better take advantage of it and try to reach Franz Josef land where the year before he had, by accident, found the ivory tusks that he brought home with such a good price at Stockholm. Never before or since have I seen so many sea fowl. They were so numerous that they hid, the, they hid in the rocks on the coastline and darkened the sky. For several days we sailed along the rocky coast of Franz Josef land. Finally, a favoring wind came up enable us to make the west coast and after telling 24 hours we came to a beautiful inlet one could barely believe it was the far northland the place was green with growing vegetation and while the area did not comprise more than one or two acres yet the air was warm and tranquil it seemed to be at the point where the gulf stream's influence is most keenly felt and of course the gulf stream starts like down there in the caribbean goes up along the eastern seaboard of the, of the u.s Canada, 
Greenland and then flows into Iceland and uh, the northern uh, northern uh, you know poles there. So it's like a it's like a channel of warm water. Note three, Sir John Barrow, Bart F R S, in his work entitled Voyages of Discovery and Research Within the Arctic Region, says on page fifty seven. Mr. Beachley refers to what has frequently been found and noticed the mildness of the temperature on the western coast of Spitsbergen, there being little or no sensation of cold, though the thermometer might be only a few degrees above the freezing point. The brilliant and lively effect of a clear day when the sun shines forth the pure sky, whose azure hue is so intense as to find no parallel, even in the boasted Italian sky. I mean, wow. I knew that I've been to Iceland uh, a couple times, uh, you know, on, on journey to the U.S. and what have you. And it, it's pretty mild there. I mean, it's still like, you know, chilly, but cold. But it's not like uh, iceberg cold. It's, it's mild from the currents, you know, from the sea currents. Okay. On the East Coast, there were numerous icebergs, yet here we were in open water. Far to the west of us, however, were ice packs. And still farther to the westward. The ice appeared like ranges of low hills. In front of us, and directly to the north, lay an open sea. Note 4, Captain Kane, on page 299, quoting from Morton's journal on Monday, the 26th of December, says, As far as I could see, the open passages were 15 miles or more wide, with sometimes mashed ice separating them. But it is a small ice, and I think it either dries out to the open space to the north, or rots and sinks, as I could see none ahead to the north. That's an interesting term. Rots or sinks. I didn't know ice could rot or sink. Interesting. My father was an ardent believer in Odin and Thor, and had frequently told me there were gods who came from far beyond the north wind. There was a, there was a tradition, my father explained, that still farther northward was a land more beautiful than the mortal men had ever known. And that it was inhabited inhabited by the chosen. When we find the following in Deutsche Mytho in German mythology, page seven seven eight, from the pen of Jacob Grimm, then the sons of Bor built in the middle of the universe the city called Asgard, where dwell the gods of their kindred, and from the adobe work out so many wondrous things, both on the earth and in the heavens above it. There is that city place called Idigenkov. And when Odin is seated there upon his lofty throne, he sees over the whole world and discerns all the actions of men. This is a Wikipedia look at, uh, you know, that mythical place. My youthful, my youthful imagination was fired up by the ardor, zeal, and religious fervor of my good father, and I explained. Why not sail to this goodly land? The sky is fair, the wind favorable, and the sea open. Even now I can see the expression of my pleasurable surprise on his countenance and as he turned toward me and asked, my son, are you willing to go with me and explore, to go far beyond where man has ever ventured? I answered affirmatively, very well. He replied, may the God Odin protect us. He quickly adjusted the sails, glanced at our compass, turned the prow in a due northerly direction to an open channel, and our voyage had begun. Interesting that they followed their, you know, gods, and they came into this inner world. Uh, note six, Hal writes on page 288, on the 23rd of January, the two Esquimaux, accompanied by two of the seamen, went to Cape Lupton. They reported a sea of open water extending as far as the eye could reach. Cape Lupton, just for reference, apparently is up in the northern part of Greenland. I think he's just saying for reference that, you know, people agree that there was open water sometimes um, up there by the poles, where everyone thought was probably frozen back then. The sun was low in the horizon as it was still the early summer. Indeed, we had almost four months of day ahead of us before the frozen night could come on again. Our little fishing sloop sprang forward as if eager as ourselves for adventure. Within 36 hours, 
we were out of the sight of the highest point of the coastline of Franz Josef Land. We seemed to be in a strong current running north by northeast. Far to the right and to the left of us were icebergs, but our little sloop bore down on the narrows and passed through channels and out into the open seas. Channels so narrow in places that our craft been other than small, we could have never gotten through. On the third day, we came to an island. Its shores were washed by an open sea. My father determined to land and explore for a day. This new land was destitute of timber, but we found a large accumulation of driftwood on the northern shore. Some of the trunks of the trees were 40 foot long, and two feet in diameter. Note seven really tells us in volume one, page 100, that Privates Connell and Frederick found a large confederous tree on the beach just above the extreme high water mark that was nearly 30 inches in circumference, some 30 feet long, and had apparently been carried to the point by a current within a couple of years. A portion of it was cut up for firewood and for the first time in that valley a bright cheery campfire comforted to man, gave comfort to man. Okay, back to the story. After one day's exploration of the coastline of this little of this island, we lifted anchor and turned our prow to the north in an open sea. Note eight, Dr. Kane says on page 379 of his works, I cannot imagine what becomes of the ice. A strong current sets it in constantly to the north, but from altitudes of more than 500 feet, I saw only narrow strips of ice with great spaces of open water from 10 to 15 miles in breadth between them. It must therefore either go to an open space in the north or dissolve. Okay, for the story, I remember that neither my father nor myself had tasted food for almost 30 hours. Perhaps this was because of the tension of excitement about our strange voyage in waters farther north. My father said than anyone had ever before been. Active mentality had dulled the demands of the physical needs. Instead of the cold being intense as we had anticipated, it was really warmer and more pleasant than it had been while in Hammersfest on the north coast of Norway some six weeks before. Note nine, Captain Perry's second voyage relates another circumstance which may serve to confirm a conjuncture, a conjecture which has long been maintained by some that an open sea free of ice exist at or near the pole. On the 2nd of November, says Perry, the wind freshened up to a gale from north by west, lowered the thermometer before midnight to five degrees, whereas a rise of wind at Melville Island was generally accomplished by a simultaneous rise in thermometer at low temperatures. May not this, he asked, be occasioned by the wind blowing over an open sea in the quarter from where the wind blows and tend to confirm the opinion that or near the pole an open sea exists. Now let's not forget this is, you know, in, in the late 1800s, so airplane, you just couldn't hop on an airplane and do surveillance, you know. We both frankly admitted that we were very hungry and forthwith I prepared a substantial meal for our well, from our well-stored larder. When, when we had partaken heartily of the repast, I told my father I believed I would sleep as I was beginning to feel quite drowsy. Very well, he replied, I will keep the watch. I have no way to determine how long I slept. I only know that I was rudely awakened by a terrible commotion of the sloop. To my surprise, I find my father sleeping soundly. I cried out lustily to him and starting up, he sprang quickly to his feet. Indeed, had he not instantly clutched the rail, he would certainly have been thrown into the seething sea waves. A fierce snowstorm was raging. The wind was directly astern, driving our slope at a terrific speed and was threatening every moment to capsize us. There was no time to lose. There was no time to lose. The sails had to be lowered immediately. Our boat was writhing in conflusions and a few icebergs we knew were on either side of us, but fortunately the channel was open directly to the north. But would it remain so? In front of us, girding the horizon from left to right, was a vaporish fog or mist, black as Egyptian night at the water's edge, and white like a steam cloud toward the top, which was finally lost to view as it 
blended with its great white flakes of falling snow. Whether it covered a treacherous iceberg or some other hidden obstacle against which our little sloop would dash and send us to a watery grave, or was it merely the phenomenon of an Arctic fog? There was no way to determine. Note 10 on page 280, 284 of his works, Hall writes, in the top of Providenceburg, a dark fog was seen to the north, indicating water. At 10 a.m., three of the men, Kruger, Nindeman, and Hobby, went to the Cape Lupton to ascertain, if possible, the extent of the to ascertain, if possible, the extent of the open water. On their return, they reported several open spaces and much young ice, not more than a day old, so thin that it was easily broken by throwing pieces of ice upon it. By what miracle we escaped being dashed to utter destruction, I do not know. I remember our little craft creaked and groaned of it as if its joints were breaking. It rocked and staggered to and fro as if clutched by some fierce undertow of whirlpool, whirlpool or maelstrom. Fortunately, our compass had been fastened with long screws to a cross beam. Most of our provisions, however, had tumbled out and swept away from the deck of the cuddy and had to we not taken the precaution at the very beginning to tire ourselves firmly to the mass of the sloop, we should have slept, swept into the lavishing sea. Above the deafening tumult of the raging waves, I heard my father's voice. Be courageous, my son, he shouted. Odin is the god of the waters, the companion of the brave, and he's with us, fear not. To me, it seemed there was no possibility of escaping a horrible death. The little sloop was shipping, was shipping water. The snow was falling so fast as to be blinding, and the waves were tumbling over our counters in reckless white sprayed fury. There was no telling what instance we should be dashed against some drifting ice pack. The tremendous swells would heave us up to the very peaks of the mountainous waves, then plunge us down into the depths of the sea, though as if our fishing sloop were a fragile shell. Gigantic white cap waves like Veritable walls fenced us in, fore and aft. This terrible nerve-wracking ordeal, which is nameless horrors of suspense and agony of fear, indescribable, continued for more than three hours, and all the time we were being driven forward at fierce speed. Then, suddenly, as if growing weary of its frantic ex exertions, the wind began to lessen, its ferry by degrees to die down. At last, we were in a perfect calm. The fog, mist had also disappeared, and before us lay an iceless channel, perhaps 10 or 15 miles wide, with a few icebergs far away to our right, and an intermittent archipelago of smaller ones to the left. I watched my father closely, determined to remain silent until he spoke. Presently, he untied the rope from his waist, and without saying a word, began working the pumps which fortunately were not damaged, relieving the sloop of the water it had shipped in the madness of the storm. He put up the sloop's sails as calmly as if casting a fishing net, and then remarked that we were ready for a favoring wind when it came. His courage and persistence were truly remarkable. On investigation, we found less than one third of our provisions remaining, while to our utter dismay, we discovered that our water casks had been swept overboard during the violent plungings of her boat. No water. Two of the water casks were in the main hold, but both were empty. We had a fair supply of food, but no fresh water. I realized at once the awfulness, the awfulness of our position. Presently, I was seized with a consuming thirst. It is indeed bad, remarked my father. However, let us dry our bedraggled clothing, for we are soaked to the skin. Trust to their god, Odin, my son. Do not give up hope. The sun was beating down slantingly, as if we're in a southern latitude, instead in the, of in the far northland. It was swinging around its orbit, ever visible, and rising higher and higher each day, frequently miscovered, yet always peering through the lacework of clouds, like some fretful eye of fate guarding the mysterious North London, jealously watching the pranks of man. Far to our right, the rays decking their prisms of icebergs were gorgeous. There were reflections amid flashes of garnet, of diamond, and of sapphire. 
a pro technique panorama of countless colors and shapes, while below could be seen the green tinted sea and above the purple sky. And that's the end of part two. We'll end this video now. Next will be part three, also defined in the same play playlist I showed at the beginning of the video. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Very interesting. I won't give much more commentary right now than, yeah, it's just a very, you know, compelling story, very, uh, you know, gripping story right now. So we'll leave it there. Have a great day. and We'll see you next time.